Actually, the, the, it, it was very strange because I, uh, there was Radosh, who was uh, my student at MIT, and I think that uh, Radosh uh, got acquainted with, uh, with uh, J started working with, with Jacob, who was a, uh, a great uh, undergraduate at that time, although you played together basketball, if, I, if I'm not wrong. And then, uh, then uh, Yufa is uh, probably the most prominent student of Jacob. Uh, moreover, he is now representing Jacob at MIT, which is the, in my opinion, the greatest place on earth when there is no pandem pandemic. But uh, hopefully, it won't change. Also, uh, yeah, I was wondering that Yufa, you, you. So which country did you represent in the Olympics? Uh, for Canada. Canada. Yeah, so I moved to Canada I when I was young. And I, I stayed see. there until I moved to college. For the, uh, so so now you are a political immigrant in the US, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. OK, so, uh, uh, so, so, so let's start. And uh, it's wonderful that uh, Yufa was able to come to Moscow in these difficult times. <laughs> Happy to, happy to be here, happy to uh, tell all of you about our recent results um, on the joint problem for varieties. This is joint work with Jonathan Tidor, who is a, a PhD student of mine, and Hans Yu, he is an uh, undergraduate student of mine. Okay, can you see the second page? Yeah, yeah, and we see you scrolling. So it's, it's okay, fine. great, great. All right, so today I'm going to talk about the joint problem. Uh, all right, so the joint problem uh, says, asks the following. So the traditional version of the joint problem asks, what is the maximum number of joints that n lines in three dimensions can make? By a joint, I mean a point that is passed through by three lines in such a way that the three lines are not all contained in some plane. So this is a genuine three-dimensional intersection. And the basic question is, well, how many joints can you make? Uh, the three-dimensional nature of this problem is such to prevent an example where I simply have a two-dimensional grid. Right? So if I put all my lines in a two-dimensional grid and put in all the diagonals, then I can easily have around uh, order of n square intersections. But now that I make everything three-dimensional, it's really interesting to figure out what is the maximum number of joints you can have. Let's look at some examples of constructions that give a lot of joints. So it gives n to the three halves order of that many joints. Uh, the first construction is, okay, so both of these are fairly natural constructions. The first construction, we take a three-dimensional grid of lines. The vertical lines, horizontal lines, and lines going in the, the third coordinate direction. Okay. So take a three-dimensional intersection, uh, three-dimensional grid of lines. Uh, if you have n lines, then this construction gives you around uh, this many, you know, n over three to the three halves number of joints. Uh, there's actually a slightly better construction in terms of the leading constant, namely that you take a bunch of generic planes and intersect these planes pairwise to form lines. Those are the lines in your configuration. And then you tripwise intersect to form joints. So then you have, when you have three planes, uh, you have this joint configuration from the trip pairwise uh, intersections of lines. Okay, so that gives you also the same order n to the three halves number of joints, but the leading constant is slightly better. This problem was first introduced in this paper uh, okay, that I've shown here with, uh, 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 called Counting and Cutting Cycles of Lines and Rods in Space. So it considered actually not just a joints problem, but many uh, 
problems in discrete geometry, computational geometry, and a lot of classic problems in there um, by this long list of authors. And so they introduced the joints problem and uh, also proved a non-trivial upper bound n to the seven over four on the number of joints. And there was a lot of work, subsequent work, that improves this exponent seven over four, uh, you know, this long sequence of work that got it down bit by bit until this problem was solved uh, in very nicely in the paper of Guth and Katz, where they proved that n lines in three dimensions, uh, in R3, form at most on the order of n to the three halves joints. Uh, so I will tell you a bit more about what are the methods involved here later, uh, but they really introduce a method of, you know, an algebraic method, a polynomial method, as we now call it, into this world, and uh, that's also had many subsequent connections and applications. I just want to mention one recent result uh, that is related to this work, but I won't really go into it, uh, namely that Hans Yu, so who is also co-author on, on this current paper, so he and I recently improved the constant factor to the optimal one, matching this example over here. So we now know not just that it's on the order of n to the three halves, but actually the constant factor is correct. There is a conjecture, uh, so I, I attribute the conjecture to Larry Guth. He, uh, by the way, so this construction actually already appeared in the original paper. Uh, but I learned from Guth that, uh, you know, one actually it seems quite likely that this configuration is exactly the optimal one. As in, if, if you have n choose, k choose two lines, then they form exactly at most k choose three joints. So our result barely misses that by one plus little one factor, uh, but it does get the right constant in front. Okay, so that's just something I want to mention, but I don't really want to go into. The joints problem captured uh, a lot of interest, not just because it's a classic problem in discrete geometry, but also because it has some important connections to analysis, namely the Kakea problem in harmonic analysis. So this connection was first shown by Wolf, and it's uh, definitely caught the interest of you know, a lot of people in many different communities. Um, let me mention also the significant development of De Vere, who gave a spectacularly surprising and short solution to a finite field analog of the Kakea problem uh, using the polynomial method, and this was a huge shock to the community. And, and this work, De Vere's work, led to a lot of subsequent developments, including you know, the work of Guth and Katz was uh, largely inspired by De Vere's uh, development. Of course, they had a lot of new ideas, uh, but you know, this development really came out of uh, this explosion that uh, came from De Vere's work. And the spectacular solution to Erdős distinct distances problem um, I would say, you know, many of the developments there were also subsequently um, inspired by uh, these aforementioned developments. The joints problem is connected to the multilinear or multilinear version of Kakea problem. So, if you think about not joints of lines but joints of fattened versions of lines, joints of tubes, then there is a sense in which uh, one is an analog of the other. Um, and a paper of Bennett, Carberry, and Tao for this connection and prior to the good cat solution actually gave some improvements on the joints problem via this connection. And turning uh, back after the solution, Guth managed to use the methods introduced in uh, these polynomial methods to go back to multilinear Kakea as well as other problems in harmonic analysis and make significant progress there. So these are just some of the connections to analysis that uh, I want to mention. Uh, but let's go back to the joints problem. So I'm interested in this, you know, at least for the purpose of this talk, purely as a discrete geometry problem. And the joints problem has many natural extensions and generalizations. Um, one of which is, you know, shortly after the Guth and Katz solution, the proof was simplified and extended uh, to work not just in R3, but in all dimensions and also all fields. Um, so the theorem, on joints of lines says that n lines in f to the d, so in this talk when I write this uppercase f, um, it means any field, arbitrary field, and the constants never depend on the field. 
blanket. So I'll just say this as a blanket. Statement F is arbitrary field and the constants never depend on the field. Um, so N lines in D dimensions have this many joints. Okay. And that's tight initially up to a constant factor, but now we also know the exact constant. And it, the optimal configuration asymptotically and also conjecture exactly is the generalization of this construction up here. Okay, so that's the joints of lines. Right? So where else can we go from here? I really like the following generalization of the joints problem, namely the joints of flats problem. I have, okay, so just to be specific, six dimensions. Okay, I think R6, but any six dimensions. I have a bunch of planes, which by planes, I mean two-dimensional flats. How many joints can you make? Here, a joint is a point contained in a triple of planes that do not all lie on some hyperplane. So just like the joints of lines, I want a point passed by three planes in independent and spanning directions. So that's a joint. And the basic question is how many joints, and most how many joints can you make from a given number of planes? There is an analogous construction to the one earlier that gives you n to the three halves joints. Namely, you take a bunch of generic four flats, four dimensional flats, pairwise intersect to get planes, triplewise intersect to get joints, basically the same construction as before. You get this joints configuration of planes. And it gives you n to the three halves, right? The same formula as joints of lines. A natural conjecture is that this is optimal. Okay, so that's the problem. I'm always happy to take questions, but this, this is the problem that I want to discuss in, in this talk. If I just a small yeah. question. Um, yes. So how does this defend, the, the, depend on the size of the field? Is this clear? Ah, okay, great. How does this depend on the size of the field? Uh, well, for the upper bound, you can, Okay, so basically it doesn't depend on the, you shouldn't depend on the size of the field because I can always take a field extension. So all of these are linear algebraic uh, conditions. So if your field is too small, take an extension. So if you are not happy with this construction, well, maybe this construction doesn't work if the field is too small, but okay, let's assume that all the fields are infinite. Right? So it's, it's not a big deal. Great, but all the upper bounds are field independent. Okay, yeah, that, that's a great question. Yeah, great. Uh, great. Any, anything else before we move on? The reason that I really like this problem is, you know, one thing is that it's a very natural extension of the joints problem from lines to flats. But also I want to explain that a very important, a key step in the proof of the joints theorem. The proof of the joints theorem, which I'll outline you momentarily, uh, turns out to be very short. Uh, at least as we understand it now. It's a, it's a very nice proof, it's, it's very short, but a key step fails badly. And, and this is uh, somehow what we're able to do is to overcome this obstacle in the polynomial method that allows us to bypass some of those difficulties. Let me uh, bring some context to uh, this question, namely that you know, incidence geometry, uh, as we know, a lot of incidence geometry is, is now known, a lot of important results, uh, many of which I mentioned. Um, a lot of what we know has to do with point line incidences, you know, starting with the seminal work of Semmerati Trotter, for instance. Um, there has been also quite a lot of effort in extending to incidences between higher dimensional objects, uh, but they tend to be more intricate in general. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of representative works. I mean, this is not an exhaustive work of incidences for higher dimensional objects, but just a couple of representative works. Uh, one is by Shoei Moshi and Tao, who gave nearly tight, so nearly means up to a plus little one error term in the exponent bound for certain point variety incidences in RD. Uh, so these formulas are in the spirit, you know, they look like similarly Trotter type formulas. Um, the method used was an extension of the Guth Katz polynomial partitioning method, which was introduced in the work of Guth and Katz in solving the Erdős distinct distances problem. 
Uh, but they use a variation of that method by only using bounded degree polynomials uh, to handle higher dimensional objects. Um, and it's this bounded variation that gives you, that requires an extra error term. Just want to mention, but you know, very vaguely, uh, this recent work of Walsh, who um, you know very recently gave a rather different-looking partitioning method that doesn't have to be in the reals. So the good cats method really requires a topology of the reals. But Walsh recently uh, has a paper that explains how to do a more algebraic partitioning method, also for the purpose of incidences among higher dimensional objects, higher dimensional, higher degree objects in, in arbitrary fields. Um, so this is also really important work. Uh, I just want to say that you know, we looked at this work and tried to use the methods for the joints of flats problem, but were unsuccessful in adapting Walsh's methods. Maybe there's some other ways, but we did not see how to, how to use Walsh's methods for the joints of flats problem. Um, on the joints of flats problem, there was uh, not, there's not really many results, but let me just mention a couple. Uh, so in the PhD thesis of Bang Yang, so who was a PhD student of Larry Guth, he proved the following, that in R6, if you, okay, so but also more generally for arbitrary dimensions and varieties, but specifically in R6, if you have n planes, then they make n to the three halves plus the total one joints, so the extra error term in the exponent. And the technique was uh, a combination of some of the things I mentioned earlier, namely show emoji tiles, uh, using bounded degree partitioning, uh, but actually bounded degree partitioning of varieties and flats. So that was a variation introduced by Guth. Uh, and it's this inductive scheme where you keep on restricting to relatively co-dimension one variety. So you start with six dimensions, you do a hypersurface, you cut it down to five dimensions, you do another hypersurface, you cut it down to four dimensions and so on. His results has two major limitations. One is that it had come up with an error term in the exponent because of the use of bounded degree partitioning, show emoji tau. The second limitation is that it actually really only works in R. Right? So it's, it uses the topology of the real numbers because it uses the good uh partitioning, which is, you know, uses the ham sandwich theorem requiring the topology of real numbers. Uh, another previous result uh, and really these are the only two. Uh, so recently, independently by uh, Hans Yu and myself, and, and also by Carberry and um, Ideopolo, uh, kind of the next, so okay, we want exact results without the extra plus one little in, in the exponent. Um, so the, the only other case that involves higher dimensional objects, joints, is joints involving one plane and two lines. Okay, so in four dimensions, I've, set of planes, so I have a set of lines, I look for joints that come from a line, a line and a plane in independent and spanning directions. And there we can have a big result up to a constant factor. Okay, so and these are the only two uh, results about the joints problem for higher dimensional objects. The next case of line plane plane was open. All right. I want to tell you about our results. So we so all of these questions in the you know, most general form that we can think of, um, in particular as special cases, n planes in the arbitrary field have at most, at most times n to the three halves. In this uh, question, resolving the limitations in Young's results, both in the error term in the exponent and also our result works in arbitrary fields. Uh, more generally, k-dimensional flats. Um, okay, so it's a similar story. Uh, and all of these bounds are tight be because of the earlier construction that involves uh, uh, taking a bunch of generic flats and pairwise intersecting. We also generalize to varieties. So instead of flats, you can have k-dimensional varieties. Instead of n of them, I just make sure that the total degree is n. Right, so in particular, if you have n flat, then each flat has degree one, so it's a special case of the result varieties. So set of k-dimensional varieties in arbitrary space has 
you know, basically, tight up, you know, we have find a tight bound, upper bound on the joint. And here by a joint, I mean a point lying in a bunch of varieties. Such the point is regular, uh, smooth, you know, same thing in this case, uh, such that the tangent spaces of this at that point span independent and uh, sort of their spanning direction. So these are the results. Right? So these are the results uh, in terms of generalization of joints theorem to higher dimensional objects. I want to um, say that, in, of course, I, I like the joints problem for a higher dimensional flats, uh, but moreover, there is a difficulty that we overcome. Uh, which I want to ex use the rest of the talk, link, namely that we may overcome a barrier in applying the polynomial method to higher dimensional objects. So that's you know, the second purpose of this talk. The first is to tell you about the results. The second is to tell you about you know, some of the uh, new ways to look at the polynomial method, uh, which we hope will have additional applications. Okay, any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, before telling you about the methods, let me just mention a few other variations of the, uh, the statements of the results. Um, so the joints theorem uh, has many, uh, the joints of lines theorem has many uh, generalizations and extensions, um, some of them inspired by problems from harmonic analysis. So I just want to mention uh, these extensions and just say that actually our results also apply to these extensions and variations as well. The first is that instead of a single set of lines, you can have several sets of lines. Uh, and this variation was proposed and conjectured by, by Carberry. Um, so counting joints, not simply formed by three lines, but counting joints where one line, we use one line from each set. Okay, I have three sets, I use one line from the first set, one line from the second set, one line from the third set, and I count the number of joints. Um, so an, an easy example is, you know, you can look at this, the vertical lines form a set, the horizontal lines form a set, set. Okay, so lines in each direction form a set and I count joints. Uh, actually that grid turns out not to even be the best example in terms of constants, although that's a subtle point that I won't get into. Okay. Um, so previously, uh, so Iliopolo proved for joint, multi-joints of lines, so this variation is called multi-joints, uh, for RD and F3, so arbitrary field means F, Yadopolo uh, established uh, multi-joints of lines and Zhang, Reishan Zhang recently uh, proved it in general fields, okay, so Marina Yadopolo. So the statement is that if you have a bunch of sets of lines in FD, then the number of joints formed by taking one line from each set is this formula here. Um, so this is equivalent to the one set version if all the sets of lines are roughly the same size up to a constant order. Uh, but this statement is significantly different if some of the sets can be significantly bigger than others. Um, okay, so we can expand extend this version from lines to varieties and the different sets of varieties can have different dimensions, arbitrary dimensions. One more variation I want to mention is that so far if a point is passed through by many lines, we only count that point once as a joint, uh, but you can consider an extension where you take into account the multiplicity. Right? So if a point is passed through by many lines, I want to count, uh, I want to consider that multiplicity. Uh, and that's also uh, known for lines. So it was conjectured by Carberry and approved in R3 by Iliopolo and uh, in general by Zhang that, okay, so this is the correct term to put in. As in, I look at the number of tuples of lines making a joint, but I raise it to an exponent and this exponent one over D minus one is the optimal exponent. It's the largest number you can put in here. Uh, it's not too hard to see. Basically, if you take these lines and you consider uh, multi-sets and you duplicate each line many times, uh, if you have a bigger exponent, then you're gonna break the inequality if you duplicate every line too many times. Um, okay, so we also 
to extend the lines to vectors. Okay, so these are the statements of results. I want to spend the rest of the talk talking about methods and techniques. Of course, if you have questions, please, please ask. So maybe one small uh, question of some. That your dependency on the degree degrees of uh, varieties is very mild, right? That's right. So in for varieties, I would replace the cardinalities by total degrees mm -hmm. in the sets. Unlike, as far as I understand, in many cases where the degree is usually hidden in, in yeah, somewhere so and the dependence is pretty bad. That's right. There are some variations uh, and some results in this direction where uh, you can only consider bounded degree varieties uh, for these, for example, bounded degree polynomial partitioning methods. Often there, you uh, the methods that are sensitive to the degrees. But for us, uh, you can replace the sets by uh, sets of varieties and only consider total degree. Great, thank you. Okay, great. All right, so I want to spend the rest of the time talking about techniques. Okay, and just to give you a sense of first, what is the proof of the joints theorem, but also what new methods we introduced to the polynomial method. But first, let me remind you the proof of the joints theorem. So this is not quite the original good cats proof, but a subsequent simplification independently due to Kaplan, Scherer, and Schusten, and, it, and, and also Carlo uh, Quillodren independently. Uh, so it's, it's very nice, it's very short. Uh, I, if you, so this book by Larry Guth called Polynomial Methods and Combinatorics, I highly recommend it. Uh, in fact, I first learned about this development um, taking a course from from Guth uh, when I was a graduate student, and that set of lecture notes was eventually turned into this textbook. Um, okay, so let's focus on the problem n lines in R3. How many joints can they make? The theorems that they can make at most n to the three halves joints up to a constant. The proof here, and basically all the proofs using the polynomial method, as we call it. Uh, they require, uh, I mean, the proof of the joints theorem is not very long, but it uses a couple of key facts. All of them are elementary, but very, very important in pretty much all the applications of the polynomial method. The first is called parameter counting. If you look at the space of polynomials with d variables up to degree n, so with a subscript, I always mean up to degree n, um, the dimension of that space is n, plus d choose d. So that's the number of available coefficients. And so this is the parameter and parameter counting. Um, we use, using this fact, you know, basic linear algebra, we deduce that if you have j joints, so here j is the number of joints. If you have j joints, then there exists a polynomial, a non-zero polynomial of small degree that vanishes on all the joints. If you take the degree to be large enough so that the dimension of the polynomial ring up to degree n exceeds the number of joints, then you have enough linear freedom to find the non-zero polynomial. Right, so this is parameter counting. This comes up all the time in this style of polynomial method. Uh, for the joints problem, I want to take g to be a, a such polynomial of minimum degree. So that will come up a little bit later. The second ingredient in pretty much all the applications of polynomial method is um, something that's called a vanishing lemma. The vanishing lemma says a single variable polynomial cannot vanish more times than its degree, or some variations of that statement. So we should think of g restricted to a line and it becomes a single variable polynomial. It cannot have more zeros than its degree unless it's zero on the line. And the third component is an argument that is specific to the joints problem. Uh, okay, but let me just go through it here. If you have a situation, you have a configuration of lines and joints, if all the lines have lots of joints on them, then by the vanishing lemma, polynomial which has small degree cannot vanish on too many points unless it's zero on the line. So it has to vanish on all the lines. Now, 
here is where we use joints, right? If you have a polynomial G that vanishes on three lines through a joint, and because of the three-dimensional nature of the joint, then the gradient of G vanishes in three independent directions. So the gradient has to vanish on the joint. Therefore, well, the gradient you know, it consists of dx of g, dy of g, and dz of g. So one of these three is a non-zero polynomial of lower degree that also vanishes on all the joints, thereby contradicting the minimum degree hypothesis of g. Therefore, some line has few joints. Some line has few joints. Now you remove this line and you do induction. Right? So some line has few joints, remove this line. The rest configuration has few joints by induction and then you conclude the proof. Okay. And that gives you the right upper bound on the number of joints. Okay, so that's the proof of the joints theorem, uh, you know, skipping a little bit of details here and there, but you should be able to fill everything in. It's, it's not too hard. Uh, there's a nice exposition of this proof in, in this book, as well as in the original papers where this proof was first found. Okay. How do we extend this proof to flats? Look at the vanishing lemma. It says a single variable polynomial cannot vanish more times than its degree. So I'm thinking of polynomial restricted to a line. Well, I have a flat now. I don't have lines. I have a flat. Well, what can you say about vanishing? How many times a polynomial can vanish on a flat? That's where pretty much all the difficulty lies. There isn't a good extension of the vanishing lemma to a flat. Pretty much all the applications that you, know, you may be familiar with of polynomial method to, um, to the, this type of problems use the vanishing lemma in this form or some close variant. You know, De Vere's proof uses a you know, good cats, um, and even earlier incarnations of the polynomial method like you know, Sudan list decoding. So how can we extend the vanishing lemma to, to, to flats, to more than just lines. So I want to explain our ideas by focusing on just the case of n planes in R6. I want to prove that n planes in R6 make at most n to the three halves on the order of that many joints. Let me begin with some wishful thinking. If we only knew some things, then we could follow this exact proof, proof scheme to prove the joints of flats theorem. So let's, let's have some wishful thinking. Right? If we only had some statement that's like, well, a non-zero two variable polynomial of degree n has not too many zeros, then we can do more or less everything that we did before and win. But of course, this is utter nonsense because, well, on the plane, the zero set of G is a curve. It has infinitely many points. So it's not finitely many points. So this is you know, complete nonsense. Um, okay, so that's, but you know, it's, it's a good start. Just trying to figure out where, how can we modify the previous proof? Okay, maybe another wishful thinking is now instead of taking one polynomial, okay, so this is actually a much more serious attempt. Is let's take two polynomials. If we had two polynomials, each of small degree, that vanishes at all the joints. And so parameter counting does allow us to find a polynomial, one polynomial of small degree that vanishes at all the joints. But furthermore, I want it so that when I restrict to a plane, these polynomials look very different from each other. Then like on the plane, they're very much transverse and so that I can apply Bazout's theorem to the two polynomials restricted to each plane and maybe I can win. So instead of the vanishing lemma, so, okay, so a, a attempt at generalizing the vanishing lemma is Bezu's theorem. Right? So vanishing lemma itself is a special case of Bezu's theorem. So maybe we try to generalize the Bezu's theorem uh, to take two polynomials. But how do you find these two polynomials? Like how can you guarantee that such two polynomials exist? This is very hard. Even the basic question of a bunch of points on a plane, like not even talking about joints, but just on a single plane of a bunch of points, can you find two polynomials of small degree, whatever that means, with no common factors that go through a bunch of these points? Uh, 
there are some partial inverses. So Terry Tao has a very nice blog post if you want to read more about, about this type of uh, problems. But that's hard. So you don't have tight results there. And in fact, somewhat surprisingly, you know, if you look at Tao's blog post, uh, what he writes is having two polynomials, but even generalizing from two to three is unknown. So inverse bazoos has all sorts of problems uh, and all sorts of difficulties. We can't even really get the strategy to work for two polynomials. But all of these are very natural things to try. And, you know, I tried them in the past, and I know people who have worked on this problem also have tried these approaches in the past. Um, the, but they seem hard. Right? Let me mention one other um, ingredient that was quite successful in extending the polynomial method. So this is sometimes known as the method of multiplicities, is that instead of asking a polynomial to vanish at a bunch of points, you furthermore ask them to vanish to high order at a bunch of points. And so this just adds into your parameter counting. Uh, conceptually, it's, it's you know, quite straightforward, but it's a very nice idea that you know, got a lot of extra uh, mileage. So for example, the multi-joint theorem of Zhang uses the uh, method of multiplicities to handle several sets of lines. So with that in mind, maybe you can extend the wishful thinking. Uh, maybe we can hope for the following, that every polynomial with a small degree vanish to high order at a small number of points. Um, now these numbers are chosen because if you count the number of parameters of polynomials of degree up to ns, it's roughly the same as the number of constraints that come from vanishing to s points, uh, to, to n points at order s. So the number of constraints on the two sides are roughly the same. So maybe you can hope for something like that. But that's also false. Uh, here's a stupid counter example. Namely, you take y to power s, a small degree, I mean, it's certainly very small degree, um, but it vanishes to high order at the entire x axis. So too many points, it vanishes to high degree at too many points. Okay, so what's wrong with the intuition that by parameter counting, we might guess the statement? Well, it's like, you know, you, you want to solve a bunch of linear equations and you want to make sure that there are no non-trivial zeros or the constraints have to be linearly independent for this to be the case. But these vanishing conditions, by asking things to vanish to high order, they may be linearly dependent. Some of these conditions of asking vanishing to high order may be linearly dependent. And in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna use this word vanishing conditions a lot. And I mean vanishing conditions in the following sense. An example of a vanishing condition is something like asking a polynomial to vanish at some given point or asking some derivatives or combinations of higher order derivatives of that polynomial to vanish at some given point. Right? So vanishing at a high order is asking all the lower order derivatives to vanish at that point. So there may be some linear dependencies and that's the only reason why this statement, this wishful thinking statement fails. Okay, so the first key idea is to handle these linear dependencies to somehow still try to get this wishful thinking, but much, much more carefully by accounting for these linear dependencies, which are, by the way, kind of hard to pin down precisely. Even if I give you the points, you know, rather explicitly a bunch of coordinates, and you want to tell me, like, what are all the linear dependencies that can come from their higher order derivatives? You know, it's kind of hard, and I don't know how to calculate it explicitly, uh, even if you give me a bunch of points. But we'll get to that later. Okay, so the first key idea, let me explain it in the following way. First, let's restrict to a plane. Okay, so I am on the plane. Don't worry about joints. Joints will come in later, but just focus on the plane. I want to construct a, a full set of linearly independent vanishing conditions on the space of polynomials of degree up to n. No redundancies. Okay, so no redundancies. Up here we lost because there were some redundancies, but we want to be very careful and not have redundancies. 
and also in particular, I am, you know, you pick some n and eventually will be some large number, much larger than the joint configuration will be fixed and will go to infinity. But for now, it's some fixed n. Okay. Attached to each point p on this plane is a set of vanishing conditions for, um, okay, by vanish condition, I mean some linear combination of coefficients of the polynomial g asking that linear combination to be zero and in furthermore this linear combination comes from asking some higher order derivative of g to vanish so for example you know these are all vanishing conditions attached to a point p if we take all of these conditions up to order m plus one uh, then any g that satisfies all of these conditions as long as G has poly, is a polynomial of degree at most n, that G has necessarily be zero, has to be zero. Right? This is a, simply the statement that a polynomial of degree n cannot vanish to order more than n unless it's a zero polynomial. Okay, so that's, so, so far so good, so far so good. So if you just look at one point, there are really no linear dependencies and you know, we have the complete picture, but now, Let's look at several points. Right? So look at several points, P1, P2, P3. Around P1, I have a bunch of linear uh, vanishing conditions. Around P2, I have another bunch of vanishing conditions. But you know, they have linear dependencies. The space is a linear space, it's a vector space of dimension n plus two choose two. I introduce all of these vanishing conditions. They have to be linearly. In the, they have to be linearly dependent. Some of the conditions have to be implied by the other. So, as linear functionals on this finite dimensional vector space, they are linearly dependent. It's important that I fix the total degree here. If I lose this n, then maybe they're not linearly independent. Right? So, if if I lose this n, then you know all of these derivative operators they are linearly independent. But if I focus on a specific finite dimensional vector space, then I must have linear dependencies just because I cannot have too many independent vectors in a finite dimensional vector space. So what I want to do is to look at all of these conditions across all the points and select a subset of them according to a procedure. I run a procedure and I pick out a, uh, a good set of vanishing conditions that are non-redundant, none implies the other, and together they're spanning in the sense that any satisfying G must be zero. Okay, that's the goal. Yeah, so I mean, all of this I'm, I want to explain carefully, but it's, it's subtle, right? So it's subtle, the various bits and pieces, and I want to, explain it in several stages. So let me first describe you um, the basic procedure, but I will add some modifications later. The first attempt. Let me cycle through all the points uh, on this plane. So I have a finite set of points on the plane. Pick an arbitrary order, I cycle through them. When I see P1, so I go through the process, see P1, I add the vanishing condition, asking polynomial G to vanish at P1. I add that into the mix. So I toss it into the bag. I haven't added anything so far, so it can't be implied by any previous conditions, so I'm good, I can throw it in. Now I go to the second point, P2, and I add the vanishing condition G of P2 equals zero, as long as it is not already implied by the previously added vanishing condition. So it's not redundant, it's not linear combination of the previous conditions. And I keep going. After I go through all the points, each time adding in G of PI vanishing, as long as it's not already implied by previous, I do that, I cycle through. And now the second time I cycle through, I start adding in higher order vanishings. The second time I add the two directional derivatives of G vanishing at P1. I throw them in, but I don't throw it in on if they are redundant. If any or either of these two conditions 
is implied by the previous conditions, I, you know, I don't throw it into the bag. So I add only non-redundant conditions. So this is basically a basis extension. So essentially I'm looking at the dual vector space of the space of polynomials up to degree n. And each time I'm extending the space by throwing in extra basis elements. I get to see some vectors and I extend the basis. Likewise, you continue the procedure, you go to the next one, point P2, and you add non-redundant subset of these conditions. Okay, and you keep going, and then the next time you cycle, you add in second order derivatives and so on. And you keep going, eventually you have to exhaust the entire space. At that point, you have found a full set of full basis of n plus two choose two um, vanishing conditions at which point we terminate. Okay, this is the basic procedure. Okay. So when we end, we've assigned a total of n plus two choose two vanishing conditions, each attached to a point in this finite point set on the plane. Great. This process solves one of the concerns earlier, namely that there were linear dependencies. Well, of course, you, know, you, you could do this in any way. You pick a basis. You have a bunch of too many vectors in the finite dimensional vector space. You pick a basis uh, that's a subset among your point, among your vectors. But of course, we do this in a specific way because of what we want to do with the joints problem. And we want to have some control over how many conditions, how many vanishing conditions are attached to each point. If we can't control that, then, you know, then, then we really can't do anything useful with this process. So can we control the number of vanishing conditions attached to each point? And actually, this is hard. Uh, even if you give me a specific you know, concrete set of points and ask me to compute you know, for large n what fraction of vanishing conditions get attached to each point as a result of this process, I won't be able to tell you. This is actually quite subtle. And things can go very undesirably. For example, if you have a configuration where half of your points lie on the grid, actually the grid is really a placeholder for a generic set of points. And half of the points lie on a low degree structure like a line. If you run this process, what you will see is that almost like most of the vanishing conditions end up going to points on the grid because on the line, there are a lot more linear dependencies between uh, the vanishing conditions. So they're gonna lose out on this process. Almost everything goes to this grid. And that's undesirable. I mean, it's maybe not so clear why this is undesirable, but let me just say this is undesirable. Somehow this process doesn't really see this line. It sees the grid, but doesn't really see the line. By the way, this example, also comes up as a difficulty of inverse bazoot. Right? As an aside, and, and you know, these are not unrelated, but just as an aside, if you want to find two polynomials, both of small degree, that are no common components, and that both pass through a given set of points, you can't do it because of this example. You cannot find two polynomials with no common factors, both with degree roughly root n, that both pass through all of these points. Okay, so how do we fix the problem that the grid gets favored? Right? So the grid gets favored and the line doesn't really benefit from this process. The second idea is to let some of the points get a head start. Okay, so previously we cycled through all the points. Okay, so let's give some preferential advantage to some points. For example, so again, we have 100 points. Suppose I run a process where you know, the 50 points on the grid get a head start. They get to cycle themselves through many times before all the points start cycling through. If I give enough head start to the 50 points on the line, then maybe I can fix the problem where too many vanishing conditions go onto the grid. Okay, so this is a fix. Um, how it's implemented is that we assign a handicap. Okay, so, you know, just like a, some game or competitive tournament, you know, we assign a handicap, which involves assigning some integer to each point 
that tells you how many extra rounds do you get to go first before the, the general cycle starts. So I assign some handicap, um, let's say 0, 1, 3, 0, minus 1 to 5 points A, B, C, D, E. So C gets assigned a handicap of 3, so it gets to go ahead three times before the general cycle starts. Uh, so it has biggest handicap, so C goes first, C goes first. A B also has a handicap of 1, so we start going through B, C. And then everything except for E has a non-negative handicap, so now we start cycle A, B, C, D. And then we start to cycle through everything. So handicap is just an extra number of rounds you get to go ahead of the, the, the usual cycle start. It gives some advantage to some points. And with this process, we can now modify the previous process of assigning vanishing conditions. So using this specific procedure as our example, first round, we assign a non-redundant set of zeroth order derivative vanishings at C, namely G of C equal to zero. And then, but we see C again, right? So before any other point comes up, C comes up again. So now we assign the first order derivative vanishing at C at those OSIN, but they're non-redundant. Okay, I don't add in redundant conditions. I never add in redundant conditions. Now B comes up, so I add the first order, the zeroth order derivative vanishing at B. And C comes up again, so C gets to one more upgrade. C gets to throw in its second order derivative vanishing. And then we get to see A for the first time. So A starts from the beginning, zeroth order vanishing at A. And B, okay, so you get the idea. So you, you go through the points, you cycle them, but maybe with some head start for some points. And you, each time you see a point, you upgrade its vanishing condition. So you keep upgrading the vanishing conditions. So that's the modified process. Okay, I want a good choice of handicaps that treats all the points fairly. What that means, I haven't told you, but let's say roughly at the end of the process, all the points, I mean, no points should get very few number of um, vanishing conditions. So I want a good choice of handicaps that does my job. As I mentioned earlier, it is, seems to be a very hard problem to calculate exactly how many, or asymptotically even, how many vanishing conditions end up going to each point. But luckily, we do not have to make that calculation. We just need to know how the number of vanishing conditions uh, as a function, right? so as a function from the handicap alpha to the distribution of vanishing conditions, how this function behaves. Right? So this is some abstract function. Let's just understand how that function behaves. And this function turns out to have three properties that we can prove. The first is monotonicity. If I let some point go ahead, go earlier, to have an even bigger head start, it's only going to have more vanishing conditions. Right? It cannot lose out by going even further ahead. So that's fact number one. There's some Lipschitz continuity. I mean, this one requires a proof, but okay, but it's intuitively obvious that if I make only a very small change in the handicap, if I only change one point handicap by one, then it shouldn't induce a large change in the number of vanishing conditions at the end. So the number, the actual conditions, the specific form of the conditions might change, but the number of conditions received by all the points do not vary very much by the end. Third, there is a bounded domain uh, property, namely that if some point gets a much larger handicap than another point, then before the second point goes, the first point already finished the process. The second point doesn't even get to start. And we shouldn't even bother with such situations. Right, so we should only, it only suffices to consider handicap, configure, handicap assignments with bounded values. Okay, so these are three important properties of this abstract function that assigns uh, that uh, function from handicap distributions to distributions of vanishing conditions. And the third key idea is that we will decide on the handicap choices later implicitly. 
I will not tell you in advance what the handicaps are. They, I will show via a smoothing compactness argument that there exists a good choice of handicaps. Okay, that's the process. Okay, so let me tell you how to finish off the proof. I mean, this may be a bit abstract. Let me, um, I'll come back to this and tell you the story again uh, with a bit of color using the model of socialism. But I will first finish off the proof, right? but, but I'll review uh, you know, what happens by telling you a fun story. Let's put different planes together. Right? So, so far we've had uh, just talked about points on a plane, on a single plane. But you know, the joints problem involves lots of planes and joints each of which containing three planes that are transverse. So I have a function that assigns uh, that, okay, so I have some handicaps assigning an integer to each joint. And I run the above process separately. On each plane, I apply the above process to assign vanishing conditions on the plane. Right? So I'm only looking at directional derivatives on that plane. So on each plane, I assign directional derivatives to the joints. Now, previously I talked about vanishing conditions, you know, for which involve a fixed n, a total degree n. Um, but these vanishing conditions, they all come from derivative operators. So I actually also record that information. I record the information of the derivative operators that give rise to the vanishing conditions. Okay, so this is the, the new vanishing lemma. So what I promised earlier in the talk is uh, we are somehow going to overcome this obstacle that in the traditional vanishing lemma, uh, one can only talk about a single variable polynomial, polynomials vanishing on a single dimensional object like a line. But now we're going to have something which involves higher dimensional objects. So this new vanishing lemma well, say the following. Okay, so this is, okay, so let me say the statement. It's maybe a little bit, takes time to process. Given a polynomial of degree at most n, I run the process, right? I run the above process separately for each uh, plane. There's some handicap, right? so for there's some handicap, I run this process. Then for each, so then there exists a joint which is containing three planes that pass through the joint transversely, such that in the process, I have produced derivative operators, D1 assigned to P on the process that comes from the first plane, F1, uh, this plane here. Likewise, D2 and D3, such that if I take the um, if I take G and I differentiate it using the derivative operators D1, D2, D3 successively, then that polynomial evaluates to a non-zero value at P. Stepping back a little bit, the usual one-dimensional, one-variable vanishing lemma also has some form, much simpler, but has some form that can be phrased in this flavor because in a single dimension on, on a line, right? So in Rx, in, on a single variable polynomial, derivative operators across different points to different orders are all linearly independent. Therefore, if you have a polynomial of degree n and a bunch of prefixed derivative operators, then I should be able to, and if I have more, um, if I have a higher degree in the polynomial than the derivative operators, then I should be able to find you some derivative operator at some point attached to that operator that evaluates to non-zero. I mean, the most basic version of the statement, you know, even without derivatives, says that if you have n plus one points on a plane and a non-zero polynomial of the, so n plus one point on a line, and degree n polynomial non-zero on that line, then g, this polynomial g, does not vanish at one of the points. So that's the most basic version. You can throw in some derivatives 
on top as you know, extra uh, decorations. You know, this new vanishing lemma is a significant elaboration of that idea, but now involving planes instead of lines. You, and it really. So, sorry, you. Can, can, yeah. I don't know. Is the right place to ask? Yeah, please, but, uh, yeah, please. Uh, can you again explain how do we go f uh, so vanishing conditions and derivative operators? Mm -hmm. uh, how to go from one to the other? Okay, great. Or, great. or this so, this this is coming. I don't know. Okay, excellent. Yes, yeah, so excellent question. So let me go back to, for example, in the in this description of the process. The second time I go to P naught, right? I adding a non-redundant subset of vanishing conditions. So here I am viewing vanishing conditions as linear functionals on the space of polynomials of degree up to n. But these vanishing conditions, they have the form, right? So I mean, if you look at how it's written, they have the form of derivative operators. So I also record the derivative operators, the form of these conditions. In the joints configuration of you know, these planes may lie in some oblique angles, but I'm recording the directional derivative, the higher order directional derivative operators that give rise to these linear functionals. Okay, and this is actually, it's, it's an important, but you know, a distinction, but a, a subtle one that I'm sweeping under the rug is that I need to record both the linear functionals and the derivative operators that give rise to those linear functionals. Okay. okay. Uh, and I have a question. Uh, can you, yes. So you have this new vanishing lemma. Can you yep. uh, say what it means for, say, the joint situation of the, in R3? Uh, like it's yeah, the question is, what can we say about joint situation R3? Um, you know, you also have this statement, and, and I, you know, I, I don't know if actually there is any simplification really when you go to R3, and you still have to run this process, but it's, it is the case that when you run this process on the line, you don't really see redundant conditions until you finish. Yeah, so, so can we see D1 is just, can we just specify what D1, D2, or D3 is, or no? Can yeah, so, well, okay, so, okay, on, if you just have lines, if you have joints of lines, yeah. then yeah. then this process is, actually, this statement is, um, it's, okay, I take it back, it's, it's much simpler, because the assignment of derivative operators, two points, is just, derivative operators up to a certain degree. And what this statement is saying is that if you have a degree n polynomial, then there exists a joint that doesn't vanish to very high degrees at some point. Okay. It's still a little bit more delicate, but, but once you know it doesn't vanish to very high degrees in some specific set of directions, you pick those directions out. Um, okay. yeah. um, this type of idea is, I mean, I think specialized to a line becomes this paper that Hans, you and I wrote for uh, getting the tight constant for joints of lines. Mm -hmm. I see. So even in this situation, it's quite non-trivial. Like it doesn't even, directly translate into some familiar or easy approach. That's part. right. Um, I think it is easier to think about in the line because you can be more explicit, but even then it's somewhat, it's not so, it's not, it's not so easy to get one's head around. Uh, yeah. I just want to say that, you know, the process, the delicate process that I described earlier of using handicaps and not, for example, why did I, didn't I let you just go through the points in some arbitrary order in whatever order that you want, rather I have to, use this specific handicap order, right? So this is not an arbitrary order. Right? So this is some order that comes from an assignment of handicaps. It's because this handicap order is the one that allows us to prove this theorem. If you run the process with an arbitrary ordering of the points, you know, letting them do whatever they want, then you are not going to have this statement here. Okay, so this is all a bit of a mouthful, and 
I'm not going to prove the vanishing lemma for you. You know, the proof is not long, but it's, it's a, it requires delicate analysis of the process. So, uh, can I ask a quick question, please? Yes. So here we're looking at polynomials in six variables, as it's written. And just say we're in R and these derivative operators, d1, d2, d3, mm -hmm. each one of them has one direction associated to it. Yep. So is the, kind of the subtlety of this result, the fact that you get this non-zero derivative with only three directions rather than a full spanning set? Is that basically the, the new thing? You're able to get a non-zero derivative without needing a full spanning set of directions? Let me um, try to answer the question this way. We are using the, um, so we are assigning vanishing conditions rather economically, right? Of course, if you had more derivative, if you have all the possible derivative operators, like if you didn't run the process, you just you know, use whatever derivative operators you want, then this statement is trivial. The whole point of this vanishing lemma is that we are using just the right number of derivative operators. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so and this is, it's a subtle process and you know, I'm still trying to think about what's the best way to explain it, um, but let me continue and, and I'll go back to run through everything you know, very quickly once again. If there may be a quick question in, in the chat, there is a quick question for you in the chat on this uh, and then we can. Uh, okay, um, ah, this is a great question. Is the handicap assignment done independently for each plane? No, the handicap is once and for all for all the joints and that is essential for this vanishing lemma to work. So one single handicap assignment for the entire joints configuration. Thank you. So the process is run independently on each plane. Okay, so let me continue and show you how to finish the proof of the joints of flats theorem. By parameter counting, um, we then see that you sum, when you sum over all the joints and count the number of choices of these triples, D1, D2, T3, from up here at a point P, when I sum everything, you, it has you, to be You I think your screen is yeah. stuck. Ah, okay. I don't know what happened. Let me reshare. Hopefully that should fix the problem. Thank you for letting me know. Sure. Okay. Yeah, no, it's good. You see now. Okay, great. Yeah, it moved. All right. So let's, okay, so, okay, let me say it again. So, so let's sum over all the joints, P, and at each joint, let's count the number of choices of triples D1, D2, T3 uh, in the above vanishing lemma. When I do the sum, I claim it has to be at least the dimension of this polynomial space, which is M plus six to six. And this is, uh, again, a simple linear algebra fact, because if you had inequality in the other direction, then just by uh, linear algebra, you would be able to find a non-zero polynomial in G that does not satisfy, that vanishes uh, all of these uh, places. So if you had the inequality going the wrong way, then I can find a non-zero G that vanishes for uh, as above, which would then contradict the vanishing lemma. So you have this inequality. Okay, now where is the implicit choice of handicap comes in? By compactness and smoothing, so there's some argument, uh, details omitted, there exists a choice of handicaps so that these terms are roughly the same across all points. Because by increasing the handicap, I mean, if, if these numbers are very different for two joints, I can increase handicap as some to smooth things out. So I can find a choice of handicap so that all of these guys are equal. Um, and using now that we're used, introducing vanishing conditions very economically uh, so that the number of vanishing conditions on each plane is exactly m choose two plus two and putting some inequalities together that I'm not showing you um, and applying AMGM inequalities, we can conclude the result. But, but these analysis, these inequalities require that these terms are roughly equal to each other or else it's not gonna have a meaningful result. 
Do you mind okay. if I ask another quick question? Please. So in uh, the paper where you check that these con the sharp constants for the joints problem, mm -hmm. yep. uh, you check that, these hand that there's a handicap so that these terms are roughly equal. And mm -hmm. in there, you use the fact that you look at this uh, product and you check that the product is equal. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that it is written as a product is used explicitly or is, is very important. Is that still going to happen here? Yeah, no, this is a product. This is just the number of choices of D1 for the first plane times the number of choices of D2 for the second plane times the number of choices of D3 for the third plane. Okay, okay, thank you. So, so that will also guarantee that none of these terms are going to be zero. Like none That's of these right. sets will be empty. That's right. And eventually, because this is a product, I can do, uh, I mean, individual terms, I can do A and G M. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's, that's the proof. So I, you know, I don't want to get too bogged down with the details, so I didn't show you any of the calculations, but the main thing I want to emphasize is this idea um, of modifying the polynomial method to handle higher dimensional objects. And let me just go through everything very quickly again, but tell you a slightly more colorful story of uh, you know, just a different interpretation. Okay, I don't know how effective it is, but let me, let me try. So you know, imagine you have this socialist government that has a bunch of vanishing conditions that it wants to distribute to all the points on the plane. And I have this you know, bunch of points and you know, basically each point comes to you one at a time in some order and asks for a handout. And maybe they did some work or got some upgrade or whatever. So each time they come and ask you for some handout and you give them some handout, but sometimes you say, well, you know, the upgrade that you did was already encompassed by other upgrades or other work that was done by previous people who came to me, came to the government, so we're not gonna give you them. So we only have N plus two choose two things to give away and well, you know, good luck. So you run this process and then you start distributing the vanishing conditions across the planes or across the points on this plane. Okay, so you do that, but then you realize that if you do this, you ask everyone to come in in this cyclic order, then maybe some uh, people who are working together in, in this you know, low degree manner will end up receiving a very small pile of, of the and vanishing conditions of the n plus two vanishing conditions. So say, okay, how can we modify this process? Well, we're going to let some people go first. Right? So let some people get an advantage. And this is the handicap. Let some of these points come first um, so that they get a head start and they get they start receiving the vanishing conditions earlier. Um, but the government doesn't really know how to assign the handicaps initially, right? so because it doesn't really understand the configurations of the points, doesn't really know how to do that initially. Um, but what you know, math tells you is that there always exists some good choice of handicaps. So that at the end of the day, all the points are treated equally. So that all the, all the points uh, have the number of vanishing conditions assigned to it, even across this joint configuration, is roughly on par across all the points. Okay, so that's the story. So that's the, uh, the new ideas that we introduce to handle polynomial methods for higher dimensional objects. Okay, so I try my best, you know, and you know, hopefully some message got through, um, but you know, Feel free to ask questions. Okay, very lastly, I just want to very quickly mention a couple of additional modifications that you need to do to handle joints of varieties in arbitrary fields. Right, so, so far, I've, everything I told you works for flats. So I've just talked about two-dimensional flats, but you know, k-dimensional flats in Rn, it's the same story. Um, if you have varieties such as the circle, um, I, what I want to do is instead of taking higher order derivatives that like DDX, I need to modify the derivatives to take into account, let's say the curvature or the fact that these are not flats. And you know, the right way to do this is to basically consider derivatives in local coordinates. So to have 
modify derivatives that take into account the higher the, the, the curvatures. Um, algebraically, this is done via local expansion, uh, power series expansion in the local coordinates. So around zero, I can express a function y. Well, on, on the circle, it's also equal to x squared plus y squared. So I can replace y, keep substituting it by this formula and expand and eventually I get a power series expansion. So as a result, the second order derivative at the origin is not just dx squared, but also y should contribute to the second order derivative. And I put in the appropriate contribution to y. Okay. Don't worry about the details. The message here is that you need to do some modifications and the modifications correspond to taking into account some curvature data or by really it's everything's algebraic using these local coordinate expansions. Um, so uh, in the language of algebraic geometry, this is called a completion. Okay, uh, and the point is so that these derivative evaluations then correspond and then give rise to linear functionals on the space of um, re regular functions. So they're like polynomials. Right? So the space of linear functionals on the space of regular functions. Because if you just look at DDX, it doesn't give rise to a linear functional. Uh, finally, one last thing is so far I've talked about the reals and everything's so good. Um, so far so good, uh, but actually you, you know, we really never needed real analysis. Like the derivatives are not really real analysis taking derivatives, but they are algebraic differentiations of polynomials of power series where we only care about coefficient extractions. And there is a natural generalization um, of derivatives to arbitrary fields called Hassett derivatives that also takes into account you know, possible numerators, uh, denominators, so that you don't have to worry about fields of finite characteristics. Okay, so that's, let me just leave it at that. And I conclude with the following exploratory question is that, you know, I think this is, Really cool that we somehow managed to extend this vanishing lemma from lines to planes and to higher order objects. And are there other places where polynomial method gets stuck in generalizing to higher dimensional objects that this variant can be useful for? So we would really like to understand other places that this new idea can be useful. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ufe. Thank you, Ufe. Shall we applaud? <laughs> we can try. Uh, and are there any questions uh, in the chat group? I don't see. No, no. Jack, no. no that was only... Oh, there is uh, something. No. Ah, okay, so let me... Read the question. So, by any chance, does the method also apply to control universal infinite families, uh, infinite families um, such of lines and flats, such that the almost maximum number of joints achieved for all finite cardinality subconfigurations of all cardinalities? Uh, okay, I've not thought about it. Maybe yeah. So I, I don't know. And um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure actually what. Um, it's meant by this question. Um, I mean, there are some cheap things you can do, like compactness arguments, but I, I don't, yeah. If you want to elaborate a little further, I'd be happy to uh, discuss. Yes, so it's a very naive question. So basically the idea is, if I understand, there is a um, the basic idea, which could be that there is a kind of genericity, a kind of genericity property that is giving automatically maybe the optimum number of joints mm -hmm. and then maybe one can try to to in order to try to prove something like that you you would like to you could say maybe i have an infinite family and because all the lines are generic then or the flats then uh, uh, all the subfamilies of the right cardinality will have optimum number of joints mm -hmm. So I was, I mean, maybe there is a way that you can up, uh, tackle that problem. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if you have like a concrete statement that may be helpful. So yes, I'm not right. still having a little bit hard time to imagine what such a statement looks like. Okay. 
but, but thanks for asking. Yes, I just I haven't thought about no, this. I also have it. I don't have it. Okay, yeah. So David Conlon asks, so am I right in saying that the field independence might be an impediment to further application in the sense that many possible application incidence balance, for example, are not field independent? Yeah, so that's a great question. So there are some variants of the joints problem and also other problems like the similarity charter that are not field independent that do use the, um, uh, the reals. Um, yeah, no, we're... Great question. I I don't know. I mean, we're looking for applications. I mean, I think there are um, certainly if there is a higher dimensional analog of some incidence problem that is conjectured to be field independent, then that may be a good place to, to try uh, this. But you know, even in the reals, maybe there are some ways to use this idea of assigning vanishing conditions economically. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so. Harbury asks, how does the compactness smoothing argument play out in the case of arbitrary fields? Um, yeah, so the compactness smoothing argument is field independent. So that really does not depend on the field. Um, we use this compactness smoothing argument also in our first paper, so with uh, Hans, that gives the tight constant on joints. Uh, it appears in a slightly different language, but it's, it's a similar argument. Um, uh, over there, yeah, it, it doesn't depend on fields. Any other question? I have maybe a small comment on the socialist story. <laughs> I, I thought that I thought that uh, it may be a, an uh, alternative uh, alternative way of telling it is speaking of assigning war rather than benefits, huh. and saying that some groups of people organize themselves so that they're lazy and they don't, don't want to do my work. Mm. And then you have to, you know, force them to, uh, by calling them several times uh, or like starting calling them earlier and the same. Ah, okay. and, you know, yeah, that's, I like that. Maybe, like even that. maybe even students, you know, uh -huh. some students work independently and some students work together and then you have to push them to, to make each individual to work. I don't know. Something yeah, like I like that. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I'll try to incorporate that next time. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot, Yushai. It was very interesting.